So to go ahead and do this problem, we have a position function and then we want to label the velocity function. So position is related to velocity and that velocity is the derivative of position. So this would be velocity in our units would be meters per second. And we would still have time on the horizontal axis. And since velocity is the derivative of position, it is the slope. So if we look at this graph, on the time interval 0, 2, this graph goes up 4 units, so its slope is 4 over 2, so n would be 2. On the interval from 2 to 4, our graph is horizontal, so it has slope n equals 0. And on the interval 4, 5, our graph goes down 3 units, so it has slope negative 3. And then lastly, we go over 2 and up 2, 4, 6. So then here we would have slope, what did I say, 2, 6 over 2, so that would be positive 3. So if we graph our function, it would look something like this. So we'd have a piecewise function that looked something like this. So to make a connection to something we've been working on a little bit later, if I were to make a square, what's the area of that square right there? Well, it's two by two. So then it would have area four. And when we get to this coordinate, what is the coordinate of that point? Two comma four, right? And then if you added the integral, it would be four plus the area under the curve here. Well, the blue part has no area, so our y value stays four. And then our area here would be below the x-axis, and that would make it negative, so this would have area negative 3. So our total area would be 4 plus 0 plus negative 3, which would give us, at this point, 5 and 1, because 4 plus 0 plus negative 3 is 1. And then lastly, the orange, if we made it into a rectangle, 2 by 3 would have area 6. So then we get up here, and 6 plus 1 gives us Seven, which is that final ordered pair. So if we integrate, it gives us the y-coordinate or the value of the original function at that point. So this is just further illustrating the idea that if we take the derivative of something, it gives us the slope. And if we integrate the slopes, it gives us back the original function, i.e., Fundamental Theorem of Calculus Part 1, derivatives and integrals undo each other. So that is question number one. So it turns out there's a couple of different ways that we can do this. The classical way that we learned back in chapter two is that we would factor, and that would factor into x minus four times x plus four all over, and then we would have um, x, we need factors of 8 that add up to negative 6, so that's negative 4 and negative 2. And then the x minus 4 is reduced out. And so now it's continuous, so we plug it in, 4 plus 4 is 8, 4 minus 2 is 2, and 8 over 2 gives us 4. But we could also notice that this is type 0 over 0, because if I plug 4 in, I would get 16 minus 16, and if I plug, which is 0, and if I plug 4 in here, 16 minus 24 plus 8 is also 0. So by L'Hopital's rule, this is the same as the limit as x approaches 4 of 2x. So we take the derivative of the top, and then 2x take away 6. And now we plug in 4. 2 times 4 is 8. 2 times 4 is 8 minus 
6 is 2, and we get the same thing. So, honestly, I think they're about the same amount of work factoring or taking the derivative either way, but what do we end up with? 4, right? So we've learned a whole bunch of different ways to get from A to B. So keep those in mind as we move forward. All right, so to use Newton's method on this problem, we identify that our function, since it's already equal to zero, is going to be sine x minus pi over 12. And then its derivative, f prime, is going to be the derivative of sine is cosine, and the derivative of a constant is zero. So then our formula is x to the n plus 1 is equal to x to the n minus f of x sub n divided by f prime of x sub n. So there's a couple of ways we can do this, but let's just plug everything in. So we would have x to the n plus 1 is equal to x to the n minus, and then we have the sine of x sub n minus pi over 12, that's our f, divided by f prime evaluated, so the cosine of x sub n. So now that we have this set up in our calculator, we're going to replace all of the x sub n's with an answer, and we're going to use our initial guess as x1. So we're going to do 0. Um, we're going to save 0 as our answer. So to do that, we just press 0, and that puts that in as our answer. And then we type in our formula. So it would be second, and then we use the minus key down here in the bottom corner. We have answer minus, we grab our fraction, the sine of the answer minus pi over 12. And then the cosine of the answer. When we press enter, that gives us x1. We press enter again, we get x2, x3, x4. And we notice after x4, it actually doesn't change. So x4 and x5 are exactly the same thing. And that gives us the value or the approximation of the zero of that function. So it would be 0.264886147. So if we wanted to find the derivative of this, we want to use the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, which says that the derivative of the integral from a constant to x of f of t dt is equal to f of x. But we don't have that. First thing we notice, our lower limit of integration isn't a constant. And our upper limit of integration isn't just x. So it's not just like this, f of x, it's f of something. So this, in our case, we have composition. So the first thing we need to do is use the integral property. So we have the property that if we have the integral from a to b of f of t dt, that that is equal to the integral from a to c 
of f of t dt plus the integral from c to b of f of t dt. So we can break up an integral by putting the same constant in between those two things each time. So in our case, we could rewrite f of x as the integral from sine x to some constant c of the natural logarithm of t dt plus the integral from that same constant c to the natural logarithm of x of the integral natural logarithm of t dt. Okay, so now we're getting closer to what we have. So on this next one, we also need to use a property of integrals. So use the property of integrals that if I have the integral from a to b of f of t dt, that that is the same as the negative of the integral from b to a of f of t dt. That is, we can reverse the upper and lower limit of integration, but if we do, it changes the sign of the integral from positive to negative or from negative to positive. So then we would have f of x would be equal to the negative of the integral from c to sine x of ln of t dt plus the integral from c to ln x of ln of t dt. So now lastly, both of these are function composition. So if we look at this and we look at this, they're both function composition. Here we're going to have u is going to be the same as sine x. And in this one, we also have function composition. And I'm not going to use u again, I'll use v. And my function composition is v is the natural logarithm of x. So then, finally, we end up with f of x is equal to the integral from c to now just u of ln of t dt plus the integral from c to v of ln of t dt. So now to do this, for each of them, it's going to be the fundamental theorem of calculus plus the chain rule. So when we find our derivative, we're going to have f prime of x is going to be the natural logarithm of u times the derivative du dx. So the derivative of u is going to be, so our u is sine is going to be cosine x, then plus we're going to have the natural logarithm of v, that's the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, times the derivative of v, so the derivative of the natural log of x is one over x. So these parts right here are FTC part one and these two guys 
home from the chain rule. Because it's df, du, du, dx, df, dv, dv, dx. And then we finally back substitute everything out. And we get f prime of x is equal to the natural logarithm of the sine of x, because u was sine x times cosine x, plus the natural logarithm of the natural logarithm of x, because v is ln x times 1 over x, which will give us this. And that would be our f prime. So that one was pretty difficult because it required us to not just use the fundamental theorem of calculus, but it required us to use some of our properties of integrals. So we first had to break the integral up from one to two different integrals, and then we had to use some of our properties of integrals that if you reverse the limits of integration, then that will change the sign of the integral, and then identify the function composition so that we could use the fundamental theorem of calculus connected with the chain rule to finally give us our solution. All right, so to do this question, we need to use implicit differentiation. So we would take the derivative of both sides of the equation, so that's d dx of 2x squared minus d dx of 6y squared is equal to d dx of 11. So the derivative with respect to x of 2x squared is going to be 4x minus the derivative of 6y squared is 12y, but we're differentiating y with respect to x, so we get a y prime is equal to d dx of 11, which is 0. So now we just need to solve this equation for y prime. So we add 12y, y prime to both sides, and that gives us 12y, y prime is equal to um, 4x, and we divide by 12y, and we divide by 12y, so finally our derivative, y prime, is equal to 12 goes into 4 3 times, so x over 3y. And that would be our solution to that differentiation problem. All right, so to calculate this derivative, we're going to need to use the chain rule. So we have y of u is going to be u to the 10th, and our u is going to be x squared minus 6x plus 9. So then y prime is dy du times du dx. So dy du is going to be 10u to the 9th times du dx is going to be 2x minus 6. So then substituting back in, we have x squared minus 6x plus 9 times 2x minus 6. I'm missing my ninth power there. There we go. And that would be our derivative of this.